Father, I thank you for this morning and for an opportunity again to uh, dive into your word, um, to carefully walk through what it is that, that you've said through Moses in this particular chapter regarding Jacob and his family, regarding Joseph and the Pharaoh, and regarding all of the different things, Lord God, that are happening. It's going to feel at some points that it's not necessarily relevant to our lives, but I pray, Lord, you would help us to see the big picture and how uh, your word speaks into that. And I pray, Lord, for myself especially, uh, I'm just exhausted, and I just pray, Lord, that you would help me to get through this, and that I would be able to really, from your word, uh, pick up the things that you have to say. In Jesus' name, we pray. Um, so, I, I just want to start here, okay? Uh, one of the things that I've been really encouraged by with you guys is your ability to understand what this time is. Uh, what I mean by that is we've had some guest speakers over the last um, few weeks for Fridays and for Sundays and different things. And um, the feedback that I get from you guys has been um, encouraging because I think you recognize what this time is. And so for anyone that doesn't really recognize what this time is, let me explain it. Um, this is not a time where the pastor gets to come out and share his or her heart. Okay? This is a time for the pastor to share from God's word what God has to say. Okay? So, yes, it's me speaking or it's whoever is up here. It's, it's, it's us. And we're preparing and we're doing all this stuff. But ultimately, in the end, what you need to be receiving is God's word. Okay? What you need to be receiving is what did God say this morning? Uh, not so much what did Pastor Kevin say or what did Pastor whatever say. It's what did God say this morning, right? And the only way you're going to understand that is if the person that's up here opens up the Bible and then tells you what the Bible actually says. Does that make sense? And, I, and I'm grateful for the fact that a lot of you guys understand that, right? Because you'd be surprised how many people don't get that. How many people don't understand that that's actually what's supposed to happen. A lot of people think that this is a time where you know, the pastor says whatever's on his or her heart or whatever they went through in the week or whatever. And that's not it. What's supposed to happen is you're, the person's supposed to come up, they're supposed to open the Bible, they're supposed to explain to you from the Bible what God has to say. That's what's supposed to happen. Um, a couple weeks ago when we were walking through the Joseph story, uh, there was a point where uh, I talked about fatherhood and I talked about family. And uh, one of my students asked me, what made you want to talk about that? And I said, well, because it was in the text. And it was uh, during uh, Genesis 44, I believe, when uh, Judah is talking to Joseph. And he doesn't know it's Joseph. He thinks he's the governor of Egypt. And Judah is making an appeal saying, let me take the place of Benjamin because of my father. And jo Judah over and over and over again talks about his father. And that's why we talked about fatherhood that day. Because it comes from the Bible. It's not what I'm going through. It's not what I thought of. It's, it's coming from the Bible. And so I just want you guys to know that. Every time you come and hear a message or go somewhere and you hear a message, what you should be hearing is not so much what the pastor says or the illustrations or the stories or whatever. It's all because all of that stuff is intended to bolster and back up what the Bible actually says. Does that make sense? Okay. So make sure whenever you're listening to a sermon, you have your Bible open and you're asking yourself, is this what God is saying or is this what the pastor is saying? It's really important that you learn how to develop that skill. Okay. Um, I'll say most of you guys have and um, have been encouraged by that because I think it's a great skill to have to be able to recognize that. So um, I don't know why I'm saying this. I just felt like I should say thank you for that encouragement for those of you guys who you know who I'm talking about. Um, but let's go ahead and talk about this story, okay? So uh, we've been in a series called God is Blank, okay? Because what we've been trying to do is dig through uh, Genesis chapter 37, all the way until the end of the book, and figure out in each chapter, what, is, what am I learning about God? What is God saying about himself through the story of this family, of Jacob, of Joseph, of everything that happens in between the brothers and all that stuff? And then also, through a couple of themes, right? So we ran through a couple themes. We ran through uh, the three themes that are in the book of Genesis, which is land, seed, and covenant. So God promises Abraham a specific plot of land that his um, people will grow in. God promises Abraham that through him, all the peoples of the nation will be blessed. God promises to Abraham that through him, he's gonna, there's, eventually he's going to be the savior of the world. And that promise of the land, the sea, and the covenant itself passes on from Abraham to his son Isaac, to his son Jacob, 
And then we've been going through the story of Jacob and his sons and his family. And so as we go through this, okay, I want you to keep all of that in mind, okay? So just to give you a refresher on the things that we've learned about God, um, and, and really the things that I've personally been wrestling with this week is that, number one, I want you guys to read all of these aloud with me, okay? So ready, set, go. God is purposeful, okay? The next one. God is... Oh, you have to press forward. Some of them should be automatic. Okay, ready? Okay. God is forgiving. Oh, no, I promise. <laughs> Alright. Wait for it. Ready? Set, go. God is with us. Okay. Here's the next one. God is steadfast. Here's the next one. God is patient. God is trustworthy. God is redeemer. God is beautiful. And God is faithful. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. You can move on. Just, um, let me just uh, read those aloud again. Uh, oh, I have it on my phone. Um, so, if you've been taking notes, okay, it's, it's good for you to write this. Um, in fact, starting next week, I'll put it on the cover so we have them all. Uh, so God is purposeful. God is forgiving. God is with us. God is steadfast. God is patient. God is trustworthy. God is redeemer. God is beautiful. And God is faithful. Okay? So let's go to Genesis chapter 47. And um, we'll learn about the next God is. This Verse 1. Are you guys ready? I still hear fingers flicking from the weird sound. Okay, verse 1. So Joseph went in and told Pharaoh, My father and my brothers, with their flocks and herds and all that they possess, have come from the land of Canaan. They are now in the land of Goshen. And from among his brothers, he took five men presented them to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, Your servants are shepherds, as our fathers were. They said to Pharaoh, We have come to sojourn in the land, but there is no pasture for your servants' flocks. But the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. And now, please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them settle in the land of Goshen, and if you know any able men among them, put them in charge of my livestock. All right. So uh, a couple things. So we're at the point of the story where where all the good things in terms of like the story in terms of it going bad for Joseph and for Jacob and everything, and we're in the turn going up. Right. So Joseph and Jacob have met. They've reconciled. Um, all of the brothers have found out that Joseph is their brother and they're reconciled. And so now, Joseph is making arrangements so that his family could live with him in Egypt. Okay? And remember, the Egypts didn't like foreigners. Okay? Um, we know that because when there was that scene where they were trying to eat together, they sat at separate tables. And also, we're told in chapter 46 that actually Egypt didn't like shepherds either. They thought shepherds were dirty people. Um, and so, if, uh, Joseph's family happens to be shepherds, and they happen to be Israelites. Or Hebrews, right? <laughs> Two things that uh, Israelites, uh, Egyptians don't like. But Joseph's trying to get them to live in the best of the land. And so he comes to, to Pharaoh and basically introduces <coughs> his family. And he has his family sort of explain who they are and what, what it is that they want to do. Now Pharaoh, remember, he's not just the king of Egypt, right? Pharaoh is considered God. Okay? So Pharaoh is a god in the Egyptian culture. So we're that we don't really understand that because we don't have that kind of a government, right? Uh, none of us worship the president as God, right? Uh, so we don't understand what that relationship is like. But you'd imagine that, as powerful as the president is, if we worship him as God, how much more powerful would he be in our lives, right? And how much more scary would he be in our lives? Does that make sense? 
So for these men, for Joseph to come and make this request, it's not a small request. Now Joseph obviously has a great relationship with Pharaoh because he's second in command. And yet, because of Pharaoh's high position, Joseph still needs, feels the need to respect him in this way. Now, the focus of these first couple of verses is the occupation of the brother. Okay? And their occupation is that of what? Shepherds. Okay? Now, it's not an accident that they are shepherds. Okay? Because this is really the start of the Israelites as a people group. Okay? So from here until the book of uh, Exodus, you have the Israelites growing out. But the reason why this, this whole story is in here, or this, this, this part of the story is in here about them being shepherds, is because, again, Moses, who wrote this book, is trying to point you towards them. Okay? Because shepherds themselves, that's a theme throughout the entire Bible. Right? These men were shepherds. Okay? The next significant shepherd after these men, can you guess who that is? It's the writer of this book. Moses, right? I don't know if you guys know this, but Moses, after uh, he was driven out of Egypt, because remember he killed an Egyptian and he had to run away, when he ran away into the desert, into the land of Midian, he became a shepherd, right? And it's a shepherd's staff that God used to do miracles when Moses came back into Egypt, right? Uh, who's another significant shepherd after Moses? Can you guys think of somebody? David, that's right, the king, right? So he was a king, but when he was a boy, he was a shepherd. Uh, can you think of a group of shepherds that were significant after King David in the Bible? Before Jesus calls himself the Good Shepherd, the announcement about Jesus' birth, who is it made to? You remember? Right, it's a group of shepherds on the hill, right? So a host of angels shows up in front of shepherds to pronounce the coming of the Messiah, the Savior. And then Jesus himself refers to himself as shepherd. So the fact that their shepherds here, uh, the shepherds appear here, significantly is, um, <laughs> you know how you know you're a real man when something like that happens and the sound that comes out your mouth. Uh, so pretend that didn't happen. Let's do it again. Drop it. Ho oh! uh, I am brute. Okay. Uh, so the fact that the shepherds are popping up is, I think, significant. Now, I've thought a lot about this, because this week has been really difficult. Um, this year has been really difficult. Um, 2015 is not my favorite year in the world. Um, so far, I hate it a lot. Okay. Um, I've gone through a lot, my family's gone through a lot, and part of it is because I am a show. I thought about that, you know? Um, and again, the reason why I think I started by telling you, I'm not telling you this because laying out, whatever. I'm just pointing out how important shepherds are. Right? Throughout the Bible, there's this, this leadership is tied with shepherding. Okay? What does it mean to shepherd? <laughs> shepherd means to lead sheep. Okay? To make sure that they're fed. To defend them from wolves. <laughs> right? To make sure they don't die. And to be honest, I don't know what else shepherds do. But those, are, those are good. Okay, those are good. Make sure they stay alive, lead them in freedom, and protect them from wolves. Okay? That's the job of a shepherd. Okay? That's what Jesus did, right? That's what Jesus did with his disciples. Um, and so that's what Jesus does when he hands out that role of shepherding to Peter, right? To feed my sheep, right? To Peter. And so the idea is every pastor after that, or every church leader after that, or every discipler after that has been a shepherd, some form of a shepherd. Okay, so that's my job. My job is to lead you guys, make sure you don't die, and then um, <laughs> keep, keep you from wolves. Okay? Um, and those are significant things. Um, and so that's been the better part of uh, my life at this church. It has not been so much as somebody who's here just to receive, but has been the shepherd. Right? And so that's been my role. And um, I share this with you because it's hard being a shepherd. It's hard being a shepherd. Um, because shepherds are oftentimes very alone, very isolated. Right? That's why shepherds hung out with each other. I'm serious. That's why they hung out with each other. Because think about it. If you're a shepherd and you're leading sheep, you're not hanging out with anyone you can talk to. <laughs> Unless you're crazy and talk to animals. Right? And it's not that 
shepherd and sheep, they, they don't have a relationship, but it's that they're not on the same level. Right? One's called to lead, and the other's called to follow. Now, on a human term, shepherds should always be leading sheep so that they can themselves grow to be shepherds. But the reason why shepherds themselves hung out with each other is because they were that's the community, right? Um, and so that's why it's good for pastors to hang out with each other. And only in the last couple months have I really started to reach out to other pastors to do that because life has been really hard this year. Um, we've had a great group of pastors uh, at our church for a long time, and now a lot of those pastors are gone. And um, that's, that's been hard. That's been painful. Um, but I tell you this because I also want you guys to know, like, as much as I love doing what I do, it's lonely at the top. Okay? Um, and my position specifically is a tenuous one, and I'm just going to be really super honest with you guys. Uh, I am the son-in-law of the senior pastor of our church. And what that means is that comes with a certain amount of baggage. It's, it's a very difficult position to be in. Uh, Everything that I do is sort of filtered through what it means to be some pastors, some. And um, we hear all sorts of crazy things. A couple years ago, my boss, who used to come to our church uh, at, at work, okay, so I work in an animation studio, and my boss, who used to come to our church, she lives in Simi Valley, and she told me this hilarious story about how one time she went to a dry cleaner that was by her house, and she was just talking to this dry cleaner, and this person, I guess, used to come to our church, but doesn't come to our church, Anyway, but at this time, uh, this person said, oh, uh, you know, what do you do? And she said, oh, I, you know, lead an animation studio. And uh, in fact, uh, one of the, uh, anyway, they started talking, oh, what do you do? And then, what church do you go to? And she said, oh, I go to church every day. And the, the owner of the dry cleaning, okay, he said to her, oh, okay, you go to church every day. That's the place where the son-in-law of the church used to be a pastor, but is now in Africa planting wells. <laughs> that's what the dry cleaner said and, this was, and the reason why that happened was because there was a time uh, some of you older students or, or college guys might remember uh, we were doing like a uh, giving charity campaign there was a time period of our church where we were really involved in digging wells and stuff and that started to happen it happened with us because we were donating a ton of money to, to those causes um, and so my boss was like no, right? <laughs> That's not where he, he's not in Africa. He's not digging well. And the drag cleaner guy was like, uh, excuse me, but I know my stuff. Right? He's in Africa digging wells. And she's like, he works for me at my animation studio. I have his number on speed dial. I can... And then she was like, why am I fighting with this guy about this stuff? She, she was just like, I can't believe this story. So she told me this story. We just had a good laugh about it. We laughed about it every year. Okay, because it's hilarious that somebody would say that. Um, now that's sort of on the light side. But there, there's also some really other things that, that, that are said that aren't so funny. And that really cause a lot of damage um, to us in terms of our family and just our reputation and different things. Uh, a couple, couple months ago, actually, um, I was told that there's a youth pastor in this area uh, who I don't know, I've never met before in my life. But he doesn't like me. Right? Like... Somebody came up to me and said, you know, there's this guy, he just doesn't like you. I was like, why doesn't he like me? He was like, I don't know, he just hears all these rumors about you. I was like, oh, great, thanks. Thanks for telling me. That makes me feel great, right? But the idea is that that stuff's happening. And it, it blows my mind because I don't know these people. I have no idea who they are. I don't know why they don't like me. I don't know what I've said or whatever. I've never spoken to them. Um, and then there's, like, really weird things, too, even within our church, right? Uh, there's a rumor that's been flying around that uh, Pastor Choi is preparing our church so that he can hand it over to me, okay, so I can become the senior pastor. Okay? Um, and people believe that. And I'm just telling you right now, that would never happen because my Korean sucks. Okay? Like, we would lose 99% of our entire congregation the Sunday that I come up to be the senior pastor and I have to speak and, and do a message in Korean. Um, it would be so bad. Okay. Um, that will never happen. But there's people that believe that. Okay? And they resent us for that. They resent our family for that. And it, it's mind-boggling, right? Um, and then there's like really, really terrible rumors. Like you guys know, I told you guys, uh, I think it was January, um, Pastor Choi got into a car accident, right? And um, that, that night was frightening. It was horrifying because... We got to the accident site about 40, 30 minutes after the accident happened. The car was ripped to shreds, and we weren't sure whether or not he was alive. We weren't sure whether he was paralyzed. We had no idea what had happened. 
Uh, but by the grace of God, it was just minimal, right? Um, but just recently, we heard this rumor that somebody is going around saying that Pastor Troy uh, drove the car and created an accident for himself <laughs> so that he could commit insurance fraud and that, so that the church would buy him a new car. Oh, my goodness. Right? That's the kind of stuff that floats around. Now, if you've never done that, if you've never... Uh, if you've only had integrity, when you hear things like that, it's bad, right? It's like, what did we do to deserve that? Nothing. But people need something to talk about, and people like to talk about just whatever, right? So I'm just telling you that these are some of the things that fly around. And so you guys don't hear that stuff, because there's no reason really for us to share that with you. But as a shepherd, that's the stuff that we get hit with, right? And so for those of us at the top, it's a lonely place to be, because... Only we understand what that's like to receive those things and to get hit with those things. Okay? Um, and the reason I'm sharing this with you is because it's exactly what was happening with them. Okay? Over time, because the Israelites were shepherds, because they were foreigners, because they weren't the same as the Egyptians, as the Israelites grow and grow and grow and grow and grow, the people of Egypt begin to resent them more and more and more and more. And eventually that leads to what happens in the book of Exodus, where... Pharaoh decides that he's going to just enslave them all. Okay? We're going to keep going. Verse 7. Then Joseph brought in Jacob his father and stood him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed, blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Jacob, How many are the days of the years of your life? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The days of the years of my sojourning are 130 years. And if you have a pen or a pencil, I want you to underline this next line. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life, and they have not attained to the days of the years of my life of my fathers and the days of their children. I'm going to come back to this, okay? Verse 10. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out to the presence of Pharaoh. Then jo Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a position in the land of Egypt and the best of the land in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh commanded. And Joseph provided his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food according to the number of their Okay? So God, in his great sovereignty and mercy, he makes sure that Joseph and his family are well taken care of. And so Pharaoh receives this family very, very, very well. He gives them the best of the land. He gives them the best of everything. He even puts them in charge of his livestock. Okay? And we'll see how much of a blessing this becomes in the verse, come, verse 13. Now, there was no food in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished by reason of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan in exchange for the grain that they had brought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food. Why should we die before your eyes, for our money is gone? And Joseph answered, Give your livestock, and I will give you food in exchange for your livestock if your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses, the flocks, the herds, and the donkeys. He supplied them with food in exchange for all their livestock that year. And when that year was ended, they came to him the following year and said to him, We will not hide from my Lord that our money is spent. The herds of livestock are my Lord's. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our land. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our men? Buy us and our land for food, and we with our land will be servants to Pharaoh, and give us seed that we may live and not die, and that the land may not be desolate. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for all the Egyptians sold their fields because the famine was severe on them. The land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he made servants of them from one end of Egypt to the other. Only the land of the priests he did not buy, for the priests had a fixed allowance from Pharaoh and lived on the allowance that Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they did not sell their land. Then Joseph said to the people, Behold, I have this day bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Now here is seed for you, and you shall sow the land. And at the harvest you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh, and four fifths shall be your own, as seed for the field, and as food for yourselves, and your households, and as food for your little ones. And they said, You have saved our lives. May it please my Lord, we will be servants to Pharaoh. So Joseph made it a statute concerning the land of Egypt, and it stands to this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth. The land of the priests alone did not become Pharaoh's. Okay. So why is this whole sort of economic section in the book of uh, it's because Moses is trying to show you the history of how Egypt came to be where it's at. Because remember, Moses 
it has just left Egypt and, and they've been wandering in the desert for 40 years and Moses wants his people to understand the history. And so the idea is this, okay? Before the famine, everyone owned their own land, everyone was free to do whatever they wanted to do. But as the famine went through this um, land, the people started running out of money, they ran out of livestock, they ran out of land, and eventually they sold themselves to Pharaoh in exchange for food. So that's how Pharaoh owns everything in the land of Egypt. So at the beginning of chapter 47, he's the king and the god of these people. By the end of chapter 47, he is the owner of the entire country in terms of all the money. Imagine if President Obama owned your house. Is that what you It's kind of like that, right? So at the end of all this, the Pharaoh is the most powerful person by far and the wealthiest. And his livestock is being taken care of by Joseph and his family. Okay? And the reason why that's here is because God wants you to understand and know that he has provided for Joseph and his family beyond their needs. So while everyone else is barely hanging on with uh, struggling for food, Joseph and his family are able to grow and grow and grow and multiply because they have the best land, and they also have jobs in terms of taking care of the livestock. So they don't have to sell their belongings, they don't have to sell their things in order to survive and to live, because they're under the, the care of Pharaoh. Okay? Verse 27. Thus, Israel settled in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen, and they gained possessions in it, and were fruitful and multiplied greatly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, so the days of Jacob, the years of his life, were 147 years. And so what you see here really is uh, a reversal of some of the things that happened in terms of the names that we're talking about. So land, seed, and covenant. First of all, covenant doesn't apply to the Egyptians because God didn't make a covenant with them. But land and seed, right? So God gives to uh, the Israelites a particular land, and says that a particular offspring will come from you that will be the savior of the world. With the Egyptians, however, all of their land they sell back to Joseph, they sell back to Pharaoh, and the seed that they're given, okay, is to plant in the ground, but for generations to come, they belong to Pharaoh. Okay? But it says that Israel settled into the land of Egypt, and they gained possessions in it and were fruitful and multiplied greatly. So as the Egyptians got poorer and poorer and lost their freedom. God made sure that the Israelites multiplied and multiplied, gained more possessions, and were blessed. Okay? Because this guy grown his people within the land of Egypt. However, this is not where they're supposed to be. This is not the land that God is giving them. So look at verse 29. And when the time drew near that Israel must die, okay? now who is Israel? Jacob. When Moses uses the name Israel, he wants us to recognize the covenant name of Jacob. He says, Israel must die. He called his son Joseph and said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, put your hand under my thigh and promise to deal kindly and truly with me. Do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my father. Okay? Um, <coughs> this action of putting the hand underneath the thigh, that's actually something that, that Abraham does in the beginning uh, of the book of Genesis where he has his servant put his hand under Abraham's thigh and makes him promise that he's going to find a um, Hebrew wife for his son Isaac. Okay? So that the hand under the thigh thing is basically like a pinky promise. Right? You guys make pinky promises? Okay? So just think of it that way. It's actually grosser than that, but I'm not going to get it. <laughs> um, and he says, so he, basically he's telling Joseph, you need to make a covenant with me right now that you will not Bury me here in Egypt, right? And he says, but let me lie with my fathers, verse 30, carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. And Joseph answered, he answered, I will do as you have said. And he said, swear to me. And he swore to him. Then Israel bowed upon the head of, then Israel bowed himself upon the head of his bed. Now why is, does the chapter end with this and what is the significance about this? Okay. What Israel recognizes, what Jacob recognizes, Okay? is that this is not the land that he's supposed to end up in. This is not the land that he's supposed to end up in. The land that he's supposed to end up in is Canaan. Okay? Now, go back to the verse that I underlined for you, or that I had you underlined. There's verse 9, right? And it says, and this is Jacob talking to Pharaoh, and he says, because Pharaoh basically asks, like, dude, how old are you, right? And Pharaoh says, the days of my sojourning are 130 years, right? By the way, what does sojourning mean? It means being a foreigner means not having my own place. 
It means not being able to settle in this place. It means I don't have a home. Okay? Now, why is Jacob saying this? He has had a home, right? Him and, his, him and his family grew up in this wonderful place called Canaan. Why is he saying this? Well, it's because of what he says next. He says, few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. What is it that Jacob recognizes? Jacob recognizes that this life is hard. That this life is difficult. And it's not that he's saying that I haven't had any joys in my life. But for the last 130 years, I look back on my life and it has been hard. And the reason why this verse in particular stood out to me was because it's in contrast, really, to what God is doing though, right? So God seems like he's, he's positioning this family so that they would have this immense blessing and there would be this future people. But what is Jacob saying? He's saying, from the perspective of where I am, all of the promises of God are in front of me. They're ahead of me. And this blessing that, that my family is going to be able to grow in this place, that's great and that's fine, but in terms of the way that my life has been, it's been 130 years and it has been filled with all sorts of evil. And Jacob's not just talking about the evil that's been done to him, but he's an evil person himself. And he knows that. He recognizes his sin. He knows there's things in his life that have been difficult and it's been caused by him. He looks at the drama of his family, that was caused by him. He looks at the deception between him and his brother Esau. And again, who tricked who, right? Jacob tricked Esau, and that broke their relationship. And so he knows that there's been evil in his life, there's been deception in his life, there's been sin in his life, right? Jacob was a person that wrestled with God. I don't know if you guys remember that story, right? Jacob wrestled with God all night long and would not let God go until God blessed him. That's the kind of character that Jacob was. And so he says this, and I resonate with this because this season has been really, really hard. And I, and I get this. I understand what's happening. What's happening is Jacob is expressing that even though there's been this difficulty that's, that's wrecked his life, he has his hope not in the life that he's living now, but he has his hope in God. Right? And that's why he says, don't bury me here in Egypt. This is going to be a fruitful place for you. You're going to multiply. There's going to be so many happy memories for you guys here in this place. But this is not the place where God intended us to be. Where God intended us to be is in the place called Canaan, to where my fathers were. So I want you to make sure, Joseph promised me, that you're going to collect me when I die, and you're going to bury me there, and you're not going to bury me here. It's super important that you recognize. And the reason why Jacob says this to Joseph is because he's setting up this pattern for Joseph. He wants Joseph to recognize, yes, you've been successful here, yes, you've been blessed here, but this is not your final resting place. This is not your home. And in fact, before Joseph dies, he actually tells his family, when you guys, when you guys leave here, okay, because he knows God's going to pull this people out of Egypt. When you guys leave, you can bury me here, but when you leave, gather my bones because I want to be buried with my body. And it's all symbolic of this idea that they're returning back to the land, right? They're returning back to the covenant place. They're recognizing that they are the offspring of uh, Abraham. Right? And all of this stuff is happening because they recognize that Jacob, as the covenant family head, as Israel, he's saying, this is not where everything is. This is not where the promises of God ends. But there is a future hope. Okay? And this is against so much of what's out there in Christianity. Right? Right? Um, there's a... Uh, thing called the prosperity gospel. Okay? And the prosperity gospel is this idea that when you do good things for God, and when you have your faith in God, good things will happen to you. Right? Um, the Christian bookstore, can you go to the next slide, is filled with books like You Can, You Will. Right? I declare, let God do the fighting. Uh, power of thought. I mean, <clears throat> these are the best-selling books on these websites and Barnes and Noble and these bookstores and on Amazon and wherever. Because so much of what we want to do is we want to turn God into a genie, right? We want to believe that if I obey God, if I do my quiet time, if I pray, if I serve God, if I go to VBS, if I do X, Y, Z, and I do all these things, that God will bless me. 
And that's the message of these books, by the way. The message of these books is pick your faith in God, he's, and he'll, he'll reward you with good things. But that's not what you see in the Bible. That's not what you saw in Joseph's life. That's not what you see in Jacob's life. Now, in general, there seems to be this idea that God is clearly in control, and God is clearly pushing immense blessing upon this people. But if you dig down deep into every single individual story, there's so much garbage, and there's so much doubt, and there's so much sin, and there's so much bad experiences. And it's crazy because every single one of us, we know what that's like, right? We live in a sinful world. We've experienced us sinning against others. We've experienced others sinning against us. We've experienced the marks of sin in this world. We know people who have died and gotten sick of cancer. We know people who have gone through horrible tragedies even though we didn't seem like they deserved it. Okay? And so all of that flies in the face of what we call the prosperity gospel. Now, I don't believe in it. I think this is some of the most dangerous stuff that's out there. I think one of the primary reasons why students graduate high school, go to college, and drop out of their faith is because they've been fed these kind of lives. Right? And there's a disappointment with God until they end up leaving the church. And as somebody who hates this stuff, there's a small part of me that clings to this. Because whenever something bad happens in my life, you know the first place I go to? The first place my mind goes to, the first place my heart goes to, God, why are you doing this to me? I've given my life to you. Right? Why are you doing this to me? I've done X, Y, Z. Why are you doing this for me? I'm not like that person who does all these bad things, but I'm a decent person. I think I deserve X, Y, Z. And we do that. And I hate this theology. I think it's from the pit of hell. I think it's satanic at its core because it's not at all what the Bible teaches. And yet there's a part of me that clings to that because... It's easy to think about. And you know what I want to do? I want to get angry at God. I want to get angry at God. I want to tell God, you suck. Why are you doing this? Um, last Friday, uh, Tracy went to the hospital and uh, for a routine checkup. Uh, because she's pregnant with our third child. Um, and at the hospital, the doctor, during the ultrasound, uh, had trouble finding the heartbeat. Tracy some time to register what that meant, but basically we lost the baby. And that has been so hard to deal with. And I had two reactions, and they're both kind of related to this. Number one, my first reaction was, this is me paying for my sin. That was my first reaction. It was, I didn't do this enough, I didn't do that enough, I didn't do this enough. I've sinned a lot, and I've done stupid things, and this is God punishing me for those sins. That was my first thought. And then my second thought was the whole, the other side of that coin, which is, but God, I've also done this, and I've also done that, and I've also given up this for you. Why is this happening? That's right, so two really opposing thoughts, but they're really part of the same thing. And it's this idea, again, that I pay for my sins. And if I do good things, then I don't deserve to have these kinds of horrible things happen to us. But that's not at all what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that I don't pay for my sin, but Christ paid for all my sin. So the reason why our baby died was not because me and Tracy are sinners. That is so hard to believe. In a situation like it, it's so hard to believe because there's doubt and there's guilt, and we're just like, we didn't do enough things, we didn't do enough things, that's why... No, the gospel, the Bible says that's not how it works. Christ took that. The punishment that's reserved for my child, the punishment that's reserved for me, and the punishment that's reserved for Tracy, we didn't actually receive that. Christ received that on the cross. That's the gospel. And then the flip side is, well, then why is all of this hard stuff happening? Well, it's because we're recognizing, we're beginning to see on a very real level what it's like to be Jacob and Joseph. Right? Um, James has some great insight into this. Um, if you look at the book of James, chapters 1, verse 2 through 4, and then 12, it says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and that steadfastness has its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And then, blessed is the man who remains steadfast in the trial, 
For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. So how does this play into our experience? What it is that we experience on earth when it comes to pain and, and destruction and sin and guilt and shame and all that? Well, what is James teaching us? He's teaching us that the trials that we go through, the difficult things that we go through here on earth, God's completing us. God's completing us. There is, in fact, something spiritual that is happening that God is completing us so that we begin to lack of. And it's painful. It is so painful. And many of you have experienced these kinds of things. And you wonder, God, why is this happening? Why am I being through? I don't want this anymore. But what is verse 12 says? He says, James says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to us. There is, in fact, when you go through trials like this, and when you can get through this, there is, in fact, a crown of life. There is a reward at the end of this. For all of us who love God, and go through these kinds of trials, and push through, and, and find our faith through this. Now, I was studying this this week. It didn't make me feel good. Not in the least bit. In fact, when you hear things like this and you're suffering, you, you kind of want to get mad and you say, I don't want your stupid crown of life. I want my faith. And that anger begins to develop. That. And you begin to just doubt whether or not do you even want to have something to do with a God who would treat you like this? Because when, when life's good and you read this, you're like, yes, I, when it comes, I will count it as joy when I'm suffering. I will count it as joy when I see things in my life falling apart. I'll do that. You say that, but then when you actually hit a wall and you hit a place where things are falling apart, I don't know how I'm supposed to count it all. I don't know how I'm supposed to look at this and be like, I'm blessed because this is happening. So where do I go from here? Where do we go from here? We can abandon this whole concept. We can't. Right? I can just say, I don't believe this. And so therefore, I don't believe the person who wrote this. I don't believe the God behind this. And then I can go find my own way. But think about the circumstances. The circumstances is, even if I believe something else, even if I decide that this isn't true, it doesn't change my circumstances. What hasn't ha What happened has happened. And I have to deal with it. And I'm telling you right now, there is no worldview that deals with this in a satisfactory way. Where am I going to run to? Am I going to run to Islam? Islam says my baby died because I'm a filthy sinner. I didn't do enough good works. I didn't turn and pray and, and do my devotions. I didn't do any of those things well. Am I going to run and turn to Catholicism? Same thing. That's what Catholicism is going to tell me. Just through the lens of Mary and Joseph and, Jacob, I mean, and Jesus. Am I going to run to Hinduism? What's the big one? The various different gods that I didn't pray to, and that's why this is me. It's going to be really more of a karmic system anyway. If I run to any of those places, the blame falls on me. It's my fault. There is no solace. There is no comfort outside of any of this. And yet the, God stands in my face and he says, you can run to all of the other worldviews if you want to. But none of those bring joy. None of those bring life. And those are the two words that you find right here in this passage. Count it all joy, and they will receive the crown of life. And that's what I need right now, isn't it? That's what I need from God. I need God to bring joy to me, and I need God to, to bring the crown of life because I feel like I'm going to die. So what do I do? I rest on the foundation of the truth of this thing. Because 2,000 years ago, Jesus rose again from the dead, I can't believe it. I can't deny those facts. Just like George Washington was the first president of the United States. Just like Abraham Lincoln is the president that's on the penny. I forgot what number of president he was, which is why I'm saying he's on the penny. 16, that's right, I knew that. History major, you said that. But just like I know those facts, I also know that Jesus resurrected from the dead. I have no doubt of that. And if I don't doubt that, then I have no reason to doubt this. 
And so even though everything in my experience and everything that I'm feeling makes me want to take the Bible, chuck it, and throw it across the room, the absolute foundation, the absolute truth of who God is and what He's done for me, that keeps me grounded. The farthest I'll ever fall is on the resurrection of Christ, is on the cross of Christ. He's got me. How many of you guys would be able to say that? How many of you guys have that sort of rock solid faith in what Christ has done as a historical figure, as the Savior? A shepherd is supposed to lead. And I hope that this helps you guys. To see me struggle, to see Tracy struggle, and to share with you what my doubts have been, and then to tell you that I didn't, ha I didn't pray and have some warm feeling in my heart. That's not why I believe this. I believe this because all the other worldviews do not provide me with any comfort whatsoever. And I believe this because I know Jesus died and resurrected. It's the only explanation for this book's existence and for Christianity's existence and for the existence of the church. And this is exactly what Jacob's doing when he says, Joseph, make sure you don't bury me here because this world, this land, this is not the place where I belong, but I belong somewhere else. And I get that now. This world, this place, this is not where I will find my ultimate joy. This is not where I will receive the crown of life here, but it's in the life to come. And I believe when I get to heaven, I will see my little girl. We think she's a girl because Tracy's morning sickness throughout this pregnancy was exactly the same as with Isabella. And given what the Bible says about infants and toddlers and what happens when they die, I know when I go to heaven, I'm going to be greeted by Jesus and hopefully my parents because they'll die before me. <laughs> <laughs> Tracy's parents will also die before us. <laughs> and this picture of receiving the crown of life, the way that I've pictured it for the last couple of days has been uh, to see my parents already playing with our daughter. That's right. No other world view provides that. No other world view provides that. No other Savior provides that. No other God provides that. All these things that we've been talking to you about, God being trustworthy, God being patient, God being... All of that, I want to combine that today to tell you that God is, and this is the last life, God is holy. That means is whatever I go through, however difficult things have in my life, I'm going to worship Him. And I'm going to praise Him. And I'm going to thank Him for what I do have because I know it's coming. And that's what we call hope. That's what we call hope. That comes from faith. That's real. So uh, I'm going to ask you guys to close your eyes and pray. So, first, if you could pray for me. Second, you guys could just pray that the faith that I'm hopefully giving to you as a role model, the faith that you've heard about today, is the kind of faith that you aspire to, the kind of faith that you have, because this is true. God, you shared with us in Genesis 47 how your plan is good and how your plan is to save a people for yourself and how your plan is to grow the Israelites in this part of Egypt so that they can be your people. And through your people, you can bring Jesus Christ, our Savior, who would come who would save us from our sins.
And that journey takes place over the entire New Testament and through the, New, through, the, the, through the entire Old Testament and through into the New Testament. And it's amazing the things that the Israelites go through. But God, we believe that you are in control. And so this morning, I pray, Lord, that as we absorb what it means for God to be worthy of our praise and worship, it's not dependent on our circumstances. And I pray that we can see that. But it's having a hope in the future, and it's having a hope in something else. Not in this world, not in this life. Because the things in this life, the things of this world, and even our own lives, they're fleeting. They, they can be gone at any time. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to, to, to have a faith that rests on the truth of who you are and what you've done. That we would recognize all the other worldviews for their flaws and see how they do not provide a real joy. But it's only when we come and we recognize that it is you that provides them. I pray that you have us to rest in and wrestle with what that means. Father, many of us here in this place, I know that we are also hurting also have this shared pain. And I pray that this would encourage them to hang on and to hold on and to trust in them. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.